Kia ora. So before we start, quick show of hands. Who knows about the Aurora that we had back in May this year? Nice. And keep your hands up if you got to see it yourself. Oh, that's fantastic. So for those that don't know me, uh, Nicole's obviously just introduced me, but my name is Matthew Bruddle. Now, it's safe to say that I'm somewhat of an um, Aurora nerd slash fanatic, whatever word you want to use, and I'm quite obsessed with the myriad effects that the sun has on Earth, of which there are numerous. And yeah, so I've been following space weather for about 15 years now, since the beginning of the last solar cycle. And over that time, I've been lucky to see Tahu Nui Arangi, the Aurora Australis or Southern Lights, quite a few times, but the Aurora we had on May the 11th, 2024, yeah, that was one for the record books, and I'll tell you why in a moment. So, oh, helps if I make sure on the right slide, there we go. So what happened? Well, we had the largest geomagnetic, geomagnetic storm in about 20 years. Aurora were visible over much of the populated world, including into the tropics in some places. What you're probably not aware of is that there were actually some significant other issues related to the geomagnetic storm that weren't aurora, such as uh, disruptions to radio communications, uh, satellites, and uh, GPS not working that well. Uh, flights were also diverted, that guy over the North Pole, and yeah, it was quite a wild event. Now, how did that happen? So, we need to talk about space weather. Now, space weather is defined as the conditions in the region of space close to the Earth, especially the presence of electromagnetic radiation and charged particles emitted by the sun that can affect human activity and technology. That's a lot of words. So what does that mean and what actually happens? So we need to talk about the sun. So the sun is a giant fusion reactor effectively, about 150 million kilometres away from Earth, quite a long walk, and it emits radiation across the entire electromagnetic spectrum from radio waves all the way up to X-rays and gamma rays. Now, most of this energy is emitted in the infrared and visible light and UV spectra, uh, which is why we have life on Earth. But during a solar flare, the sun emits bursts of radiation of much higher energies, so going up into extreme ultraviolet, up into hard X-rays, and sometimes into gamma rays. Now, these are all parts of the sun. So like any good ogre, the sun is made up of layers. We have the core, which is here. That's where all the magic happens. That's where all the nuclear fusion happens. Uh, the bits that are interesting to us are the photosphere, which is there. Um, so that's where a lot of the features, such as sunspots, hang out. Um, sunspots are formed basically by structures known as granules, which are just bits of plasma being convected up from the inside of the sun and kind of cooling down at the surface. Um, I'll get to sunspots in a moment. Now, the next layer up is the chromosphere, and outside of that we have the sun's corona, the second most interesting part of all of this. So the sun's corona effectively acts, if you can imagine, like the Earth's atmosphere being not very dense, quite gaseous, still plasma, um, but really, really hot. And normally it kind of just sits there leaking out into space. That's what gives us the solar wind. And yeah, sometimes lots of it can be ejected at once, which I'll get to in a second. Sunspots. So these are our biggest driver of space weather. And as well as causing spectacular effects on the sun, they are quite interesting in their own right. You can see that they honestly look, uh, look really cool if you look at them through a solar telescope. So you have convective currents inside the sun that are bubbling up plasma up to the surface. Now, sometimes that plasma has really strong magnetic fields embedded in it, and that causes the convection to kind of stop. So the, when the convection stops, the plasma starts cooling down, forming these darker spots, which are sunspots. Now, obviously, there's magnetic fields in there too. So they are more or less about 2,500 times or greater the strength of Earth's magnetic field, so they're actually really, really powerful. Now, when they bubble up, they don't tend to have nice orderly magnetic fields, they tend to be all sort of tangled up in weird ways, and when they're tangled up in weird ways, they want to spontaneously untangle themselves, which gives us solar flares. So when we talk about solar flares, they are emissions of much higher energy radiation, mainly focusing in the X-ray spectra. And we classify them. 
so you can measure them in watts per square meter, but that's you often end up for, with very big, very different numbers. So it's much nicer to give them a letter classification. So B class solar flares are B C class are kind of where your background X ray solar flux kind of sits at normally. Um, M class tends to be you have so you have actual flares happening and releasing energy. And then X class solar flares are the largest solar flares. Now the way the system works is it's logarithmic. So it's all powers of 10. So a C1 class flare is 10 times as big as a B1 class. X1 is, big than, is 10 times as big as the M1 class. And an X2 is twice as big as an X1. You kind of get the idea. Now, when the sunspot's magnetic fields untangle themselves, uh, we get a magnetic reconnection event. And these release absolutely huge amounts of energy. So this is kind of what a solar flare looks like. This is taken from a satellite known as a solar dynamics observatory, sorry, words. So that there you can see that big flash and the kind of just releasing more energy there. Now when all of that energy gets released, so this is quite a long duration flare, there's lots of little individual parts to it. When that massive amount of energy gets released, that blows out massive chunks of the, solar, the sun's corona in what's known as a coronal mass ejection or a CME. Now, coronal mass ejections are made up of billions and billions and billions of tons of hot plasma blasting up from the sun. Huge, incomprehensible numbers, basically. Now, as well as being blasted out from the sun, they're blasted out at extremely high speeds. So, maybe early 300 kilometers per second, but the fastest measured ones were about 3,000 kilometers per second. So, 1% of the speed of light for um, as a relative comparison. So the bits of the sun corona contain trapped magnetic fields and when those trapped magnetic fields interact with Earth we end up with what's known as a geomagnetic storm. So this is what a coronal mass ejection looks like. This is from, incidentally, the sunspot group that gave us that really nice aurora back in May. See you there? Looks impressive. That is, I think that left the sun at about 1,500 kilometres per second. So, yeah, it's fair hiking. <laughs> so, what happens next? Well, the coronal mass ejection travels through space and it eventually whacks into Earth's magnetic field, causes it to reverberate, and basically, it effectively resonates like a bell. Now, when you have the Earth's magnetic field reverberating like that, it actually induces currents through the Earth, so known as geomagnetically induced currents. It also induces currents in the ionosphere, known as ring currents, and it's these ring currents with that energy, all that energy that's being dumped into the ionosphere interacting with um, the rarefied gases in our upper atmosphere that cause aurora. So meet AR3664. Now this guy is the sunspot group that caused the aurora we had back in May. First appeared and was numbered on May the 3rd, 2024. Now what was remarkable about this particular sunspot group is you can see how fast this is growing. It basically doubled in size. Most of that growth happens in about 18 to 24 hours. We consider that entire region is about 15 times as wide as Earth, Earth's diameter. It's huge. There is a massive amount of energy being released here. Um, what was also interesting was the fact that this sunspot group was near the sun's equator, which meant that when the sun rotates, because, spoiler alert, the sun rotates, um, the sunspot group eventually was going to rotate around to more or less pointed Earth. Now, if you had a solar flare, hypothetically speaking, happening when the sunspot group was pointing at Earth, all of that plasma gets blasted directly at Earth, and you can potentially have some very strong geomagnetic storms. Now, the Wednesday of that week, um, Basically, when all the growth happens, basically the solar X-ray flux of the sun increased to about M class and was sitting there. So normally that would be considered a fairly decent flare. It was constantly emitting that much energy for, I think, maybe four or five days at least, and then occasionally flaring with fairly large East class flares. So what did the sunspot group do? Well, I'm going to show you. So as I said, it grew to about 15 times wider than Earth it released about nine X-class flares, um, which are the largest type of solar flares, 
and yeah, um, launched about five earthbound coronal mass ejections. Um, I'll play that through again. There we go. Now the full halo ones, like those two there, um, that is basically all of the material being fired directly at Earth. So there's a lot going on there. Um, and you also saw what's known as the solar proton storm, which is when you have a whole bunch of charged particles basically just interfering with the camera on the satellite. Um, so it was quite significant. Now there's an agency in the US called the Space Weather Prediction Center, or SWPSI, and they, pre <laughs> that's apparently how you pronounce it. Um, anyway, they do some modeling on these things because it's kind of interesting to know from, for a number of different reasons when the sun is doing shenanigans. And this was interesting. So what they modeled were four of those earthbound coronal mass ejections kind of merging into one big, large, kind of just sweeping through. And they predicted that it was going to hit Earth about, that's 1 p.m. New Zealand time on Saturday the 11th, so around lunchtime. Now, I saw this modeling come through on the, I think this came out on the Thursday, and I saw that, I thought, okay, cool. It's going to be a long weekend. Um, probably a good time to charge my camera batteries and get some sleep because I feel like Saturday night is going to be possibly kind of interesting. Thing to remember though is predictions are just that, predictions, um, and there's, they're usually reasonably accurate to maybe plus or minus 12 hours, but sometimes they're not very accurate. The CME misses, we don't get aurora, and you kind of just spend the night staring at the dark sky. Um, but often they are actually more or less on the money, and this one, well, it was. In fact, it arrived about six hours early. So I woke up at about 8 a.m. on Saturday morning um, expecting that the CME was going to arrive later that day. Imagine my surprise when I saw some photos posted on Facebook from somebody up in the Hokianga in Northland with Aurora, with the cell phone, taken with a cell phone camera just before sunrise when the sun's already fairly bright. That's that top image there, um, Derek Turn, I think his name is. Um, and then what surprised me even more, this was taken from Blockhouse Bay, which if you don't know Auckland's well, is in central Auckland. <laughs> now, I've never seen that happen before, so it became very clear that this was going to be a significant event. Now, this here is a, um, graph from a magnetometer based in Hobart. This is a thing that measures Earth's magnetic field and how it changes. You can see here about 5 a.m. New Zealand time, this is in UTC. Um, but 5 a.m. we get the first impact and then suddenly, bang. It's a, quite a large variation there. Now, I obviously had to do some science on this because I'm thinking, well, this is clearly a strong event. And I had one of those interesting thoughts that which one, one thought leads to another. Can I measure this with a smartphone? Smartphones have compasses built in. Smartphone compasses are basically magnetometers. So if you leave your smartphone sitting still for a while and measure the magnetic field with them, I was thinking, hmm, could I actually see the geomagnetic storm using my phone? The answer is a resounding yes. So I'm in these plots, I'm comparing, um, these are, vi yeah, I haven't done the proper calculations to make the data exactly right. Um, but this is comparing the data with a magnetometer at Airwell, just north of Christchurch, kind of near West Melton. Yeah, those pretty much line up. Uh, so that answered that question of, yes, you can detect strong geomagnetic storms using a smartphone. Now, impacts. So this storm was clearly exceeding forecast expectations. Uh, Space Weather Prediction Centre predicted that this was going to get up to maybe G4 class at the maximum. This very quickly reached G5. So. I'll also explain a bit about what that means. So geomagnetic storms, there's a rough classification system from one to five. One is a eh, little bit of aurora to five being radio communications are out, possibly issues with power grids, basically the whole nine yards. So we were sitting at that level. And then I see a notification from TransPower that that issued a grid emergency notice. Now they have processes in place for when you have a large geomagnetic storm like this because you have power you have energy being induced in the power grid that shouldn't be there and that can cause widespread blackouts and all sorts of other interesting effects. So one of the things they do is they go and switch off a whole bunch of lines that they don't need and are possibly going to be adding to this problem. So they've kind of got to balance keeping the power grid going but also not having so many lines connected that you end up with a whole bunch of geomagnetically induced currents in your power grid and causing things to trip left, right and centre. Now obviously we didn't have widespread power outages so they did a really good job and kept the lights on, um, but that's what they were dealing with on Saturday. Another thing too, 
Farmers in the US and Canada who were in the middle of planting corn discovered that their precision GPS tracked tractors were no longer working. If you're trying to plant corn really accurately in the field, maybe down to 10, 15 centimetres accuracy, you need precision GPS. GPS is one of those things that doesn't work all that well during a solar storm, it turns out. And there are a bunch of fairly hilarious TikTok videos of farmers um, basically showing, yeah, I discovered this morning that the sun can make my tractor not work. Um, it was a surprise to a lot of people. Now, how does this impact GPS? Well, GPS is effectively a whole bunch of atomic clocks in orbit that are transmitting the time to your GPS receiver on Earth. Now, the receiver knows where all these satellites are, and it knows the time that the signal was sent from the satellites, and it compares them and figures out basically how long the path was to the satellites, uses some complex math that I don't understand, and works out your location. Now, if you have um, disturbances in the ionosphere, so as I said earlier, um, space weather events like that tend to create plasma bubbles in the ionosphere. Plasma is conductive. When radio signals go through conductive things, they tend to refract all over the place and suddenly, yeah, the signal gets distorted. Um, the, yeah, the, basically the path length changes and suddenly your GPS receiver isn't able to work out where it is. Now, this caused some issues uh, because one of the ways that you can land at an airport in bad weather is using precision GPS. And there's a few, there's a few systems worldwide that let you do this. Um, and one of them, which I'll show in the next slide, actually shows kind of what happened with these uh, disturbances. But basically that meant that aircraft have other backup methods for landing, obviously. Um, but precision GPS-based approaches were not working. So this is a map of that blue is basically can we land using precision GPS at an airport. Now watch what happens at about, there we go. So within the space of about half an hour, this is about two hours after the geomagnetic storm started, the WAS system, the Wide Area Augmentation System, was basically inoperable. So that meant no GPS-based approaches into airports for about 24 hours um, this lasted for. Now this last happened, as far as I've been able to determine, back in 2003 when we had another similarly sized geomagnetic storm. So. Yeah, this doesn't happen that often, but it was, yeah, it was a pretty big impact. Um, lot, yeah, um, self-driving Teslas also got confused because it turns out they need GPS to work. Um, and they were just flat out refusing to drive. Um, I was trying to get one of my friends to join us out at Crash Ready Spit, and um, I was trying to send him my GPS location that night. It wasn't happening. Um, I was kind of joking that it was, you know, space weather that was interfering with it. Looked at the data later on, and absolutely it was. <laughs> Now, other impacts, HF radio. So this ties into a couple of things. So for transoceanic flights, uh, you have, yeah. Um, transoceanic flights, you use HF radio because you might not be in range of satellites or, you know, the grounds basically. Um, and that relies on the ionosphere to work. This is a um, map of the D region of the ionosphere, which those signals bounce off. You can see here, it's bright red. That means it's absorbing all the signals. Uh, these two things you can see here first. This is during a solar flare event. So, yeah, um, nothing on the daylight side of the Earth, but also there's a polar cap absorption event happening at the same time, which means that there's no HF communications at the poles. There's so two impacts to that. Um, first off, obviously no HF communications, but B, um, if you are a flight flying over the North Pole, you are now being exposed to a much higher radiation risk because of, yeah, um, because of all of the um, high energy particles bombarding the ionosphere. So flights get diverted and so take a much longer path and use a lot more fuel, that kind of thing. Now Europe's skies turned pink um, that afternoon. For, that was night time for us, but um, sorry, that was afternoon for us, that was the night time. Um, and so this became pretty clear that this was a significant event. So these cameras are from all over Europe. Now, our turn. So we had visible aurora during sunset, which I'll show you on the next slide. It was naked eye visible from much of New Zealand, including up to Northland. Um, 
in Christchurch, I saw it directly overhead at times with other phenomenon like the um, rural corona that you don't normally see unless you're at the pulse. And it was bright enough to cast shadows. It was insane. Um, so there's some pictures. Um, that there is taken just on sunset. Um, yeah, sun setting, and then you have these bright red beams in the southeast. It was weird. Um, that was taken just after midnight, so we had another substorm and things got really bright. Um, the sky looked more or less like this with the naked eye, which was crazy. So how rare was it? So we last had widespread aurora visible in New Zealand in uh, March 1989, and the last G5 class German next storm we had was in October 2003. Previous events, looking back through newspaper archives, we've had in the 1950s, 1960s, and we get them maybe every 20 or 30 years or so. Comparing this to other geomagnetic storms during the space age, this dates back to 1957. Um, space Weather Live put together a comparison of all the largest geomagnetic storms. The one we had in May sits at about seventh since 1957 in terms of strength. But what was also interesting was the duration. This lasted for a good 24 to 36 hours. A lot of these other ones only lasted for maybe 12 hours. Um, so it was, it was a doozy. Now, in terms of how we're tracking for possibly seeing more aurora in future, so this is a graph showing our progression against the solar cycle using sunspot number. So that's the peak of solar cycle 24 there in 2014. We're about here. Um, there's two things you notice. First off, the peak of the solar cycle is here. Second of all, we're trending way higher than what was expected for the solar cycle. So while those events are reasonable, what, like what we had in May are reasonably rare, um, uh, we could possibly have another one in the next few years, you never know. Now, how do you take photos of aurora is the million dollar question. So location's really important. You want a location with a view anywhere to the south that's reasonably clear, and a dark sky. Um, sometimes you can get away with having a bit of a moon, but ideally if it's a new moon, that's your best bet for seeing, certainly seeing with the naked eye, but also taking photos. Scope it out beforehand, um, so you'll notice this is the Canterbury coastline. This is probably one of your best places. There's Birdling Splat there. Um, it's, yeah, you don't want to be driving out there for the first time at night because there's sand and other obstacles and you don't want to get stuck. And it's also kind of annoying for other people if they're already out there and then you've got somebody coming in with high beam headlights. Um, it's, 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 it, it can be a bit frustrating at times, but definitely better for best results, head out before it gets dark. So being in the dark, head torch, really important. Um, red light is your eyes are far less sensitive to red light than they are any other colour. So if you are having to set up a camera or anything like that in the dark, red light's your best bet. And um, you'll be amazed at how quickly your eyes adjust to seeing with just starlight. It takes maybe 15 to 20 minutes and you will be amazed at how much you can actually see even without a head torch. But just as quickly, if you have somebody nearby with a cell phone screen or a white light torch or bright headlights, your night vision gets wiped away pretty quickly. Taking still photos, so you basically want the lens wide open. So f3.5 is a good start. Uh, it's as wide open as my kit lens on my DSLR goes. You want to increase the ISO, but not too much, because otherwise the image gets quite noisy. And you want to definitely want to have a tripod. Um, I've forgotten my tripod one night going out there to take photos of Aurora, that was not fun. Um, when you can see it with the naked eye and you don't have a tripod and you can't take photos, it's, yeah, you only make that mistake once. Um, <laughs> and yeah, experiment with shutter speed, so maybe keep it at 10 seconds, oh, 10 seconds, maybe a bit longer, but that's about what you want to aim for. Time lapses, same rules as still photos. I took this on that night um, with my smartphone actually. Um, to keep it nice and smooth, maybe 15 frames a second of, or higher if you can make that happen. Um, and also a tripod. But yeah, um, it also, if you're taking 15, if you're 15 frames a second to use in the time lapse, that means that for one second of time lapse, you need 15 photos. If you're taking them every maybe five, 10 seconds, it, it's quite a time consuming process, but you can end up with quite rewarding results. Conclusions, so May, our geomagnetic storm we had then was the strongest one we had in about 20 years. Uh, had pretty far-reaching impacts, but because 
people plan for these things, and this is reasonably well understood. Everything mostly was alright, so yeah, you didn't have massive power outages and you didn't have planes falling out of the sky or anything like that. Um, there's going to be a lot of academic papers written about this event, so what was quite good was A, how well documented it is, because social media and cameras that can take photos of the sky, uh, but also just the amount of data that's available from various um, instruments and stuff means that um, scientists are able to figure out what happened and also what we can sort of expect to happen with potentially larger geomagnetic storms. Uh, they can go bigger than that, really, but they definitely can. And Christchurch turns out it's actually a really great place to see aurora from. Even though we're not that far south, we've got a really good coastline with clear views to the south with no lights in the way. Um, so yeah, there's, you can you could probably see aurora reasonably often. Certainly this year there's been maybe five or six events that have been decent enough to take photos of at least. Um, obviously nothing like what we had back in May, but um, they do happen relatively often. Um, especially now we're getting to solar maximum. Anyway, that was my talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, you turn the back. Um, I've got two questions, but I've just forgotten the first. <laughs> <laughs> On human psyche? It's a good question. Um, nothing that current science really shows, um, other than, oh my god, the sky's on fire, um, <laughs> which is a pretty natural response to seeing the sky like it was. I don't know if there's been any, any other effects proven, but I could be wrong on that. Um, the other I remember now. Nice. What do we look at to Ah, that's a good question. So there's a number of um, Facebook pages that Aurora Chasers like myself use to share information about, yeah, if there's been something interesting in the data um, and if people think that there's going to be something to happen. Uh, one of them is, uh, I think, Aurora Australis New Zealand. Um, there's also the Southern Hemisphere Aurora Group. Um, but yeah, there's a few sites on the internet. There's also, if you're wanting to look at the raw data as well, um, Space Weather Live is a really good sort of aggregate of yeah, pretty much all the stuff that you'd want to be looking at. And it's reasonably easy to digest once you know what you're looking at. Yeah, you. The Cali the Carrington event? That's a good question. So there's a project running out of the University of Otago called the Solar Tsunamis Project. Um, Professor Craig Roger and um, a few others are basically trying to answer this question. So they think that this event was, I think they said, 15 times weaker than what the current planning is for for large geomagnetic storms. Um, I will also point out that a lot of the research they've done was what helped Transpower with their response. Um, to this event, so yeah, obviously switching things off and <laughs> making sure that you didn't have large geometrically induced currents where you didn't need them, kind of thing. Yeah. Can you walk us through the sequence of events from um, observing something on the sun to when the aurora is visible? Yeah, so basically, yeah, there's a satellite solar dynamics, of, solar dynamics observatory, which is a NASA satellite, which um, NASA and ESA, I think, which is where a lot of the animations came from, um, that data. So that satellite is constantly watching the sun and takes some really cool imagery. So people see solar flares turn up in that. Um, and then because there's, it's kind of difficult to park a satellite in space when it's kind of just floating there, there's no real convenient points to actually have it hang out. Um, the, there's obviously imagery of the sun. Um, there's also a couple of satellites near Earth called ACE, the um, Advanced Composition Explorer, I think, and Discover, which hang out closer to Earth that actually detect when um, the solar wind from these events is about to arrive. Normally you have maybe about an hour, depending on the solar wind speed, maybe between half an hour and 90 minutes uh, between detection at ACE and Discover and actually hitting the magnetosphere. Um, 
and then yeah. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.